we'll get started now. Um, the theme today is really is supposed to be macular dystrophies, but I have a talk that's both retinal and macular dystrophies, and I think it's important to cover both every um, every year. But what we'll do, and we'll just try to stay on time, the retinal dystrophies, which is the first part of the talk, we have to get through before before we're halfway through by 7.30, so that we have enough time so that macular dystrophies doesn't get cut off, all right? So I've been here 22 years. When I came here 22 years, I was brought here in addition to be a retina doctor, but really to fill the need of having someone who, could, who uh, specialized in inherited retina diseases and would see the patients, the number of patients that we have out here in Utah with inherited retinal diseases. And it's, it's a tough specialty to have, but it's an important specialty to have in any uh, academic center. We're here in you, uh, <coughs> being an academic center and being an inherited retinal disease person. I'm, I am per, you know, the person that's kind of the person of last resort to these patients. They've typically had things going bad in their eyes. Their vision is going bad. They know something is really wrong. It may be affecting multiple family members. But for the, the private practice doctors out in the community, the community doctors, they don't, they often are not educated in how to deal with these patients. They're not educated in counseling the patients. They don't have enough time to, to really spend with the patients. And these patients are coming here, when they see me, they're coming here to really learn about their, their condition and understand what the implications are. So when and you're now, now in my clinic, when, you're, when those of you are with me in retina, I have in every clinic slot, in every clinic session, half day session, I have an inherited retina disease spot for a new patient and one to two for follow up patients. And that's to give them enough time <coughs> when, they, when they come in because they are not quick patients, especially the new patients. And, they, and we're trying to make things more organized so the patients understand. It's just like neuro. It's going to take a half day to, do, to get things done. It's not going to be a quick in and out. And it's also so that it doesn't overload my clinics, because I do have busy clinics. And it was turning into a disaster when I would get three or four new patients that were all inherited retina diseases in one half day, because I couldn't give enough time. So it's important. I find it very rewarding to talk with these patients. And yes, we haven't made enough progress in 22 years, but we're making some. I mean, we now have genetic testing available, as, you'll, as we'll talk about today. We now know a lot about these diseases on a, molecular, on a molecular level. There are clinical studies that are going on and some clinical treatments that are just now starting to get into clinics. So it has changed a lot. We still have a lot more to do. So with regard to retinal dystrophies, the ones that affect the entire uh, the panretinal diseases, we, I see a lot that are, um, that are here. And the ones that you're going to see most commonly when you're here with me here in clinic are retinitis pigmentosa is by far the most. That affects more than 100,000 people in the United States. You will see fewer, but they're important. You'll see fewer uh, syndromic retinopathies. You'll see even fewer stationary retinopathies, where there are stationary inherited retinopathies, where they are not progressive by definition, but they still can be visually disabling. And then uh, you'll see cone dystrophies, as, as I'll discuss, cone dystrophies are a little more tricky because our diagno the diagnosis is harder to make. There's a lot of uh, cone dystrophies out there where I really don't understand what's going on yet. And then you have to just remember there are toxic retinopathies that can simulate uh, inherited retina diseases and uh, pseudo-retinopathies, which really aren't even inherited retina diseases. So, Retinitis pigmentosa is, has an estimated prevalence of about 1 in 3,000. About 100,000 people are affected in the United States. And, so, and this is considered one of the most common forms of inherited retina blindness. There's a large variety of inheritances, and that's what confuses a lot of patients in that they may have a vague family history or they may have no family history at all. And why are we calling this an inherited retina disease? Are they going to pass it on to their kids? What, is, what are the implications? And of course, there's a large variety of, of clinical courses and genetic causes. And it's very important to understand, especially the clinical courses, in that you know, patients go to the internet, read about retinitis pigmentosa, read about how 
devastating this is, and I'm not going to min minimize that it's a devastating disease, but there are a lot of people that do very well or have very mild cases of retinitis pigmentosa. And especially now that we understand some of the genetics and do genetic testing, patients that we thought were are just kind of funny retinal changes with age, we're getting better at recognizing, well, this is retinitis pigmentosa. You can diagnose retinitis pigmentosa in a 70 or 80 year old person because they just have a mild case that's going on very slowly. And then there are limited uh, interventions available that this is changing. So when I see a patient referred with retinitis pigmentosa, the, the clinical symptoms are usually the first sign why they're being referred in, unless they have a strong family history. And pretty much universally, if you take a history from a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, they're gonna say their first Signs of this were night blindness or poor vision at night. They couldn't see the stars when they were playing with kids, with their fellow kid, when they were playing as kids, they didn't see as well at night as their friends were, were seeing. So that's first, and, they, and since they may have had it all their life, besides knowing they're slightly different from others, they may not be, if they have a relatively mild case, they may think that's just what, they're, what normal is, or that's, that's part of the, uh, the spectrum of normal. Eventually, they start developing more symptoms in classic retinitis pigmentosa, such as loss of visual field. And that, again, can be kind of subtle and sneak up on patients. Remember, with visual fields, when, you, when we do the, large, the, the Goldman visual fields, you know, we all see, with normal vision, we see 120, 130 degrees of binocular field. And you can, you can lose quite a bit of this before having any, any real symptoms that you're that your visual field is down, although we can detect it. And you can still drive quite well with a 90 degree visual field, 60 degree visual field is legal here in Utah. And it's not until you're down to a 20 degree visual field that people are legally blind. And there's a reason that legal blindness is established at that is mobility becomes very severely decreased at that point. And patients <coughs> are, are having trouble you know, run, they're bumping into things, that's when they start thinking about that they, they're really affected when they're down to 20 degrees. And it's amazing and sometimes disturbing how some patients can t tolerate that until they're down to 20 degrees and come driving in with visual fields that are, that are asking to renew their driver's license when I say, you know, you really have to start thinking about legal blindness, not driving anymore. So in classic retinitis pigmentosa, cone visual acuity and cone function is preserved until late in the course of the disease. And the end stage, unfortunately, for retinitis pigmentosa can include no light perception. So the first signs are bone spicule formation, peripheral retinal atrophy, waxy pallor of the optic disc and, optic, and also optic nerve head drusen, and vascular attenuation. Those are the things that you need to recognize that will be on the boards. Those are the classic things that you find. You'll also see vitreous cells, uh, which are kind of degenerate, maybe degenerating photoreceptors, other condensations in the vitreous. They very commonly get posterior subcapsular cataracts. Why, I don't know, but, they, but that's what they do. And they can get cystoid macular edema, which is important because that starts affecting their preserved central vision. And, the, and unless they get cystoid macular edema, in a classic RP, if it's not a, a rod cone dystrophy or a cone rod dystrophy, the macula will be preserved until late in the disease. So when a patient comes in with RP, you want to do a clinical history, what we discussed about the signs and symptoms that they have. A family history is very important. You need to ask not only how did your parents and your siblings do, but do you have cousins that seem to have the same, the same symptoms that you had. Then, of course, we do a dilated retina examination and photography visual field testing, electroretinography. So, and that's very, visual field testing is much more than just your standard 30-2 uh, Humphrey visual field. You wanna get a visual field that really looks at every, at the whole visual field, so that's gonna be either a manual Goldman visual field or an Octopus 900, which we have here. The uh, Goldmans, they do pretty well here, but it is uh, technician dependent as to whether they really do a good job. I don't worry in my clinic whether they're dilated or not dilated. I just want to get the field, and you know these patients have often come in from far away, and if they're stacked up in neuro and they've got five hours of testing of other things, I just say move along and we'll get the visual field 
later on in the session, but it is important to get that, get the visual field done. The Octopus 900 is a good machine, but it's grueling. It takes 20 minutes to do the visual field. It's a lot of testing on that. The machine breaks down and sometimes throws away all the data at the end of the, se at the, end of the, the session, so it's a problem. And then electroretinography done by Don Creel, I'm sure he gives a lecture on that, is important. I'm no expert on electroretinography, and, but it's, impo it's important early on in the testing for most new patients coming in. I want them to have an electroretinogram or at least a documented electroretinogram in their record. If they got it done elsewhere, I don't need to repeat it. I find, as we'll discuss with electroretinography, it's not very good in following the patients, but it's good to have kind of a baseline. If they have a recordable, recordable electroretinogram, then of course you can follow that. But um, an awful lot of patients have nearly unrecordable electroretinograms from the start. OCTs are important, obviously, to look for um, macular edema. And then genetic testing is pretty much standard, and we'll talk about that in the next slides or two. And we're hoping to have our genetic counselor up and running. She was supposed to start this week, but there's been some delays. So hopefully she will be starting in two weeks, we hope. So, oh, just going back here, you can just see how the visual field, see this is laser, can go from you know, relatively preserved with patches of missing visual field to more where it kind of goes in. And then on this patient, eventually, it's not shown here, but in some patients they'll have a classic ring, ring scotoma where the center is preserved. They'll have, or here's a ring scotoma here. The center is preserved but they still may have some peripheral islands and eventually it can go to, to, to legally blind and then tiny at that point and eventually even snuff out. And electroretinography is helpful in distinguishing various uh, classic RP from things like cone dystrophies, uh, congenital stationary night blindness, all of this, but I'll leave that for Don Creel to talk about on this. But typically in classic RP, they're gonna have terrible um, terrible scotopic ERGs, but may have relative preservation of the photopic ERG. So RP comes in all genetic flavors, and it's one that geneticists love to study because it can, everything is possible in this disease, and it's a disease that literally now I think we're up to a count of 350 different genes that can cause this, literally thousands of different mutations, so no longer can we test on the boards you know each of these, but you do have to know some of the key, some of the key genetics of this disease and a few of the key genes. So autosomal dom well, is one of the more common ways that RP presents. And the problem though is that in autosomal dominant is that it's the relatively mild form of the disease which makes the genetics a little more tricky in that patients will say, yeah, I have a few cousins with this, an uncle had this disease, but my parents are just fine. Well, it turns out autosomal dominant can have reduced penetrance. So it may mean that in a, in a classic autosomal dominant family, it may mean the parents have no symptoms, but if you look hard enough, test them genetically, or look at more subtle electrophysiology that they are affected. So um, here in Utah, we see a number of these pedigrees that are like this, large pedigrees that show in classic highly penetrant disease, it'll be a 50% chance to be past generation generation. Autosomal recessive is uh, about 20 or 30, maybe 20 percent. It's also a lot of sporadics because if you don't have a large family, you may not, know, you may not, it may look random within the family. If you have a large family with 10 siblings, then yes, if you start seeing a few siblings affected and no one else in the family, you think about autosomal recessive. It's a little more common, or it's certainly more common in um, in communities where there's a lot of inbreeding, basically, marrying cousins. And that's not so true here in Utah, except, of course, on uh, a few of the polygamist uh, enclaves do, do have inbreeding, but it's not, not as common as, the, as it is in other populations. X-linked is another one that can be a little bit tricky because that means that the females are carriers, the males get the disease classically. But there are exceptions. There are females that can be affected uh, that it, it get, or get late onset versions of the disease. It's just that the males are more, are more severely affected. And, um, but both X-linked and autosomal recessive tend to be the more severe forms of the disease. And then you may get mitochondrial 
syndromic and then sporadic, which means we just don't, it's the only person within the family. So for autosomal uh, dominant, we said it's more common. It has a mild clinical course, variable penetrance, and the most common defects that you should really know about is probably, is probably rhodopsin is the number one. That's the most common mutation you're gonna see. That was the first, first one found in autosomal dominant RP. And that has to do with the fact that it's, it's rod specific and it's, uh, and it's not found anywhere else in the body and, that's, and it's a key protein that, that forms about 80 to 90% of the protein in the rod outer segments. So if you have a defect in rhodopsin, that's a pretty severe problem. Either the rhodopsin is dysfunctional or more commonly there's a misfolding effect and it tends to cause long term, eventually in a dominant form it will cause degeneration of the photoreceptors because it's mislocalizing within the photoreceptors. Other ones that we commonly see are RDS peripherin, which is a structural protein in how they form the discs in the, in the eye uh, or in the photoreceptors. And then you'll have ciliopathies, which have to do with the cilium, the connecting uh, connection between the outer and the inner segment. Wolfgang Baer here and Jun Yang are experts on ciliopathies. And so that's a very, there's a number of different mutations, but you just need to know that it, it tends to affect the connecting cilium as a very key part of these proteins. And then for reasons that we don't understand, a lot of RNA splicing factors, why this kills off your photoreceptors when this is a defect that should affect every cell in your body, it probably has to do with how specialized the photoreceptor cells are and that uh, they don't have as much backup as other cells in our body. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, protein misfolding and misdirection is important. And shown here is rhodopsin, and you can see just the number of, this is old, but you can see the number of mutations and just where they are all through the protein. Recessive RP is relatively uncommon, except if there's a lot of consanguinity. It's often severe and early onset, and it often has to do more with the metabolic cycles within the retina, either the visual cycle or the transduction cycle, and these are severe and a lot of them make up what are the family of diseases known as Labor's congenital amaurosis. So these are diseases uh, where the kids are born essentially severely visually impaired. And it, this is one of the first ones where uh, diagenic was, uh, inheritance was established where you can have a mutation in one gene and another in an associated gene, but together that gives you RP. So that just makes the, the inheritance even more complicated. And then there's X-linked, which means that the males are affected, the females are carriers. These are usually very severe. This is, as, this is a classic choroideremia patient here. And uh, classically, you'll either have mutations in choroideremia or in the choroideremia gene or in things like RPGR or some of the other ones that are, that are found on the X chromosome. And then mitochondrial in my practice is pretty rare. Uh, it's, uh, there's a maternal inheritance. It's often associated with neurologic disease, so you're just as likely to see this in neuro-op clinic and see, and um, they have so many other things going on that this may, that this may be kind of left, uh, that they may not be noticing it as much, or it may not be the focus of the patient. And then there's syndromic RP uh, that you just have to be aware of that multiple systems can be affected. They do like to ask this on the board, so you need to know Classic ones like deafness plus RP gives you Usher syndrome. And there are many different Usher syndromes, but they're going to ask about it. They're going to show you pictures with extra digits, bardet beetle syndrome. That's, they like to ask about that. That also has obesity, um, mental, uh, ment mental slowness, other things like that. And then there's senior Loken syndrome, so that's, there's a, and APERTS, so kidney disease can also be involved. And then there are other ones that are really rare, but they like to ask about it because they've been around for a while. Refsum disease, gyrate atrophy, which some of which I've never, even though I've written papers on Refsum disease, I've never seen a patient with it yet. Gyrate atrophy has classic pictures of it, but again, you just, I've tested for it many times, it's just not here, but it's been known for decades. And then there's sporadic RP, which may be recessive with no family history. This, how could this happen? Well, you may have a new founder mutation. It may not actually be retinitis pigmentosa. It could be autoimmune or ca uh, cancer associated or melanoma associated. And also think about other things that 
may be modifiable or treatable. Think about toxic retinopathies. Think about vitamin A deficiency. It does happen out there, either self-induced, which is really rare, or people who've had gastric bypasses or other, other reasons that they could have malabsorption. Uh, that's, that's at least treatable, and you can cure the patient. And then, rarely you're going to see stationary retinopathies. I see no more than one or two of these a year coming through. And that means they have no clinical pro progression. They may have night blindness, uh, but visual field is often preserved. And some of the ones include fundus albi punctatus, where you get all sorts of little white dots here. They have night blindness, but they function reasonably well. Now, with the treatments, clearly you want to give them the social supports, the genetic counseling. Uh, but the newest thing that's coming is gene therapy, so RPE65, one of these recessive diseases that's really rare, is, uh, as you may have heard, I think, when we've had the reps come through here, is uh, going through the approval process and has, has they've spent ten, literally tens of millions of dollars, if not a hundred million dollars, to bring this to market. They've been able to show that by using subretinal injection of an AAV, uh, replacement for the gene RP65 that you can get better mobility, some slowing of the disease, but you do not cure the disease. And you were gonna, when this comes out, we're going to have a lot of patients coming in asking, well, why can't I have this? Why can't my kid be cured? Well, it took you know essentially a moonshot type project to get one of these to the market. It's going to cost probably a half million dollars per eye, and it's super rare. I, I have the first patient that I finally found with an RP65 mutation here in Utah, and I've got a big practice, and that patient is 40 years old and is looking to get an Argus II implant. It's way too late for him to be getting any gene therapy. So, um, and interestingly, he was the very first patient I ever saw here 22 years ago. Uh, came in, so the so that's coming. It's gonna, it's our first step. Hopefully, more of these will come along down the line. The next one for gene therapy is going to be and we're gonna be part of some of these clinical trials. It's gonna be choroideremia, and then Stargardt disease is also coming down the line. But these are not easy trials to do. Uh, we're also looking at growth factors, stem cells. The, the patients know a lot about them, but there's a lot more <coughs> hype than actual, uh, than actual progress in this disease. And then there's all sorts of small molecules, val valproic acid, Tudka, which is toro ursi deoxycholic acid, Retino retinoids that have been gone through clinical trials, have been tried. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that, they're, that they might be helpful, but when they go through rigorous, rigorous trials, uniformly they've failed, so they're not very good. And then um, electrostimulation is all sorts of things that patients find on the internet that I have to just say they're on their own. There's no good science why this would work, but if they want to spend their money, they can. It's probably not going to hurt them any other way. And then artificial vision is coming down the line, that's the Argus II implants, which again are super expensive and are not commonly used yet. I had one of my patients come through recently who's had one implanted in Minnesota and she's, they see mild improvements, but the newest thing is to actually go to cortical implants because the technology is not that great. Um, cone dystrophies, I'm gonna go through, I'll, I think we'll, we'll skip that, uh, we're gonna skip ahead to macular dystrophies and toxicology, because I do want to have enough time. So we will go here. Okay. So we talked a lot about, um, a lot about, or we just talked about retinitis pigmentosa, which are rod dystrophies, things that are panretinal diseases. But just as much I will see in my practice macular dystrophies, and that's really the focus of what we need to cover in the last half. And that means you know, the macula is the unique part of the primate retina that is involved in central vision, uh, dre reading, driving, recognizing faces. We have a lot of age-related macular degeneration, but I see a very significant number of inherited retina diseases that focus on the macula as opposed to the peripheral retina. Now, we've learned that some of these diseases we're going to talk about do affect the rest of the photoreceptors, but for reasons that, for whatever reason, they tend to be focusing on the cone-rich regions of the retina, or that they are uh, that they're focused, or that there's something unique that uh, that gives primarily a macular phenotype. 
The most common macular dystrophy you're going to see in my practice is Stargardt disease, uh, but we, and we'll cover that in a little more detail. Uh, Best disease is common, and then you'll see a lot of just many other, you know, th things that are rare or things that I've never seen in my life. And then, of course, there's age-related macular degeneration. And we've learned that some cases of, of age-related macular degeneration, once you get enough imaging, is actually maybe just late-onset Stargardt disease, something that... Uh, and so you have to have an open mind about what patient, what, when things don't look typical. So Stargardt disease is the most common inherited juvenile retinal dystrophy. Its estimated in incidence is one in 10,000 as opposed to one in 3,000 we talked about for retinitis pigmentosa. So that means it's not gonna be as common in a general inherited retina disease practice, but it's common enough that you will see it, if when you come on the retina rotation, you will see a number of patients coming through. It's, and these patients do, um, you know, can be legally blind in terms of their below 2200 vision, but they tend not to be, it doesn't go to total blindness, and it doesn't get a whole lot worse typically than 2200 vision, which means that the patients can still read with uh, large print. They can be very successful in a lot of, uh, in a lot of you know, tough specialties. Uh, I've seen physicians with it. I've seen, uh, I've seen pati uh, patients who are successful lawyers, scientists, et cetera, so they can do very well. Uh, about, this means about 25,000 to 30,000 people are affected in the United States, and this is a disease, unlike retinitis pigmentosa, there are very few, there's really one disease you need to, or there's one gene you need to know about. Uh, for, the, for the recessive disease, and that's ABCA4. But there are rarer dominant forms that you will see in my practice. And there is some evidence, although it's still controversial, that heterozygotes may have some, some increased risk of age-related macular degeneration. So there is um, some of the dysfunction that you see that causes Stargardt disease in its milder form may also cause some problems in age-related macular degeneration. So, what is the typical clinical presentation of Stargardt disease? Well, in this case, typically they have totally normal vision at birth and, uh, and early childhood. These patients, there's, everything was going just fine, and then they notice a decline in central vision, most typically in the teenage years, but there's huge variation. It can be before age 10, and I've diagnosed certifiably patients at in their 60s and 70s, where that's the first, first time they've ever been diagnosed with Stargardt disease. Uh, they, the, pic, the pictures that you'll see classically have macular atrophy that may have a little bit of a sheen, what's called beaten metal, uh, with, and they'll have little flecks, little yellowish spots here that kind of radiate out. They're pisiform, which means they look a little bit like fishtails, and in the more severe cases, they will go beyond the arcades and the more mild cases they may be within the arcades of the macula here. And typical, typically the end stage is about 2400 vision with preserved visual, with preserved peripheral visual field. The, um, when, when we're looking with a patient with Stargardt disease, we wanna know the clinical history. Again, you know, the, the clinical, the most typical clinical history is a patient who was doing just fine in school, but suddenly their school, their school performance dropped. They're not seeing well, they're complaining, they're just not, not, they're sitting in the back of the class and have no idea what's going on in the front of the class anymore. Reading goes way down. The, um, they may have a positive family history, especially here in Utah with large families, and you wanna do an eye exam and fundus photography. And the problem is that this is easily missed by even good retina specialists. When you look in, the, the flex can be fairly subtle. The, um, the atrophy can be, can be mild in the beginning. On the other hand, we're now in the age of imaging, and as long as you get something like an autofluorescence, you'll see this increased hyperfluorescence from the deposits associated with Stargardt disease. You'll see these little flex. This, this is picked up very well in the imaging. Um, and then, when we did a lot of fluorescent angiography, they had what was, classically a dark choroid where it just was more highly contrasted again because of the lipofusin deposits. Um, if they do a full field ERG, it's usually normal or only mild, mildly affected and genetic testing is very important. Now I mentioned before about, I didn't go into genetic testing for RP, 
when someone comes in with classic RP, we have a, I have a panel uh, that we get from Spark that we send away that has 31 genes. It's missing, you know, I told you there were more than 250 genes. So it's missing a lot of genes. But if you send a panel, a free panel, they'll get back within a month. And more than half the time, they will tell me what the, what the mutation is in a patient with RP. In, uh, for Stargardt disease, it's not free right now. The testing costs about $500. But it will, I'm pretty good at finding that, uh, uh, selecting the patients. I'd say that 70 to 80% of the time they will find the mutation in the ABCA4 gene. The problem with ABCA4 is it's a huge gene. It requires a lot of sequencing. There's, there can be complex deletions and other mutations in it, so they do miss things in this disease. But especially since you're trying to find two mutations, the chances you're gonna find at least one in a classic Stargard patient is 70 to 80% at least. And it's important, yes? I don't, the, your, even the multifocal is not very useful, so I follow them with imaging more than anything else and, and, vi and visual function, but I don't order a lot of, I don't order a lot of ERGs on, on Stargard patients. Um, I, the reason why Stargard, Stargard disease happens is it's a disruption of vitamin A processing within the eye, so that normally when rhodopsin bleaches the all trans retinoids, uh, have to get in, get into the disc membrane. They're pumped out. They're, they pass through and get out of the disc membrane by the ABCA4. This is an old slide. It used to be called ABCA, a, ABCR, but it passes. The retinoids are then kind of transported out of the disc space and on through the visual cycle and to the retinal pigment epithelium to be reisomerized. In a, in in class in recessive Stargardt disease. This gene or this protein is defective. The retinoids sit in the membranes too long. They then start reacting because they're, react, they're reactive aldehydes, start reacting with lipids, the phosphatidylethanolamine in the lipids here, in the lipid layer, and eventually you start generating a lot of these uh, end stage products, these bis retinoids that are two vitamin A's condensed together that are stuck there and they these become and accumulated in the retinal pigment epithelium and are ultimately toxic to cells. That's kind of the basics. It's a much more, there's a lot of research. It's a much more, I could talk for an hour on this, but it takes, but that's kind of the basics is that you get a lot of these bis retinoids and for whatever reason, whether complement activation, whether they're detergent possibilities or whether they're generating free radicals uh, that are damaging, but these eventually, these are the bad actors in this. And the goal is to try to, in treating this disease, is to decrease the formation of these toxic bis retinoids. So how are you going to try to do this? Well, we talked about that vitamin A, the, the, the bleaching of 11 cis retinoids to all trans retinoids. Let's see where we that's going on here. So the 11 cis retinoids on rhodopsin, you get the all trans retinoids. These are the toxic compounds that start forming, or these start forming the bis retinoids. So how are you gonna decrease this <clears throat> formation of these bis retinoids? Well, one is to just say, well, don't use the visual cycle so much. So you tell the patients, wear sunglasses, stay out, don't, uh, or avoid excessive sunlight. That doesn't work very well because there's more, there's still cycling going on in the visual cycle. There's still vitamin A processing. Another thought is to do visual cycle inhibitors is to give an oral inhibitor of RPE65. These inhibitors we've tried in uh, age-related macular degeneration and they didn't work. They didn't slow down geographic atrophy. But the, company is now, the companies that have these are now seeing, will this work in Stargardt disease? And we recently in my clinic, we've been part of early phase trial where we've done a, given, a, given a, month, a month dose of these RPE65 inhibitors and see do the patients tolerate it? And we had five patients in the trial. They get a lot of side effects. They get night blindness from these uh, compounds. They see all sorts of bizarre colors. Um, and we, and uh, we don't know what dose. They were on three different doses. But of our five people in the study, two swore that, two stuck it out for, two, for a full month and said they would never, ever take the drug again, at least at that dose. They could not tolerate the side effects. Two said, 
yeah, I noticed my color vision was off a little bit and my dark adaptation wasn't so bad, but sure, I could do this for two months if this potentially could help me. And one was right in the middle. So hopefully when the code is broken, it's the high, it's the real high doses just means it's too high in these patients and there are lower doses that could be tolerated. If it's kind of random and that some patients are gonna drop, are gonna be just disabled even at low doses, that bo doesn't bode well for the trial. But ultimately, if you're gonna do these small molecule therapies, you're gonna to have to, uh, these are gonna to have to be taken for years at a time. And it's gonna be big trials and there's a limited number of patients out there. Um, gene therapy, sounds obvious, just replace the bad ABCA4 gene. The problem is it's a huge gene. It's very difficult to package it. It's very difficult to deliver it. Uh, there are companies that are trying this, uh, they're, and they're starting to contact me, so we may be doing gene therapy in the next few years on some of these, some of these patients. Stem cells, again, try, is a restorative, but it's not yet uh, ready for prime time. And of course, you wanna do genetic counseling, especially since this is a recessive disease. If in a family, if, they're, if a 10-year-old has it and they're still having more kids, they at least need to be warned that they may get the, get the disease, that they may have more children with this disease. On the other hand, in a patient with Stargardt disease, you tell them, as long as you don't marry a close cousin or as long as you don't pick the one in 20 random people that are carrying a mutation, your chance of getting, of your children being affected is low. But it does happen and I have you know, one, I have one kind of ticking time bomb family where a patient with Stargardt disease married the, the son of a, of a Stargardt patient. So they now have 50, if you calculate it out, they have a 50% chance that their kids are gonna be affected. But we may be able to catch those kids early through genetic testing and put them into these trials. And then of course, there's low vision services that have to be done. Um, but not all Stargardt disease is uh, ABCA4. There is a dominant form of Stargardt disease that looks every bit the same in, in a lot of these patients, but uh, is much more rare. I do have one family of 18 family members with this disease that we discovered and characterized there. And so this means there's only one or 2,000 affected patients in the, in the United States. And this is in a completely different gene in the ELOVL4 gene here. And we have even Utah is even more unusual in that we have, a, we have our own kind of founder mutation here. But they get Stargardt disease with these flex again. They can have a pattern dystrophy. And this is different because it has a whole different pathophysiology. Instead of targeting the visual cycle, in this, it's a lipid metabolism disease. And that's just shown here where it's, uh, the, it's the enzyme involved in making what are called very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are special fatty acids that are found in the retina that seem to be important for, uh, for constructing the discs in the rod outer segments. And in this family, it's more a nutritional problem. If you can, if you can give them high doses of fish oil or if they consume it in their diet, they tend to be relatively protected against this disease. We did try a clinical trial of fish oil in these uh, families, and they were so non-compliant that we never could prove that it was really affecting them, but I still recommend it within the families. The other common one you're gonna see in clinic is Best disease, and it's dominant, and they typically uh, present in young age, the classic Best disease, with these vitelliform lesions, these yellowish lesions, and it's, uh, these can eventually lead to choroidal neovascularization or macular atrophy here. But Best disease has a lot of different presentations. Again, you, I've diagnosed patient, patients in adulthood with Best disease. There's, it's incomplete penetrance is almost the rule, not the, uh, you know, not the exception in this disease. I've even seen incomplete penetrance even between eyes where one patient has a full-blown case of Best disease in one eye and they, the other eye is totally normal. So, and you can have multifocal uh, lesions instead of just the classic ones that you'll see in the pictures in your textbooks. So they can have little yellowish spots here. And they're all mutations in the Bestrophin gene. And that's an RP specific ion channel protein. And so, and there's some evidence that atypical age-related macular degeneration can also be associated with this disease. So how do you test for this one? And how do you manage it is you see Classic lesions, that should raise your suspicion. 
Um, they are loaded with lipofuscin, so they're highly fluorescent. So again, autofluorescence you know, is part of the standard workup when my patients come in for in any sort of inherited retina disease. And there's widely variable visual acuity. Someone like this could be 20-20 and asymptomatic with this disease, or could be, uh, could be very heavily affected. And how do we diagnose it? Clinical history, family history, eye exam, photos, especially getting autofluorescence, and then electrophysiology, uh, uh, electro electrooculogram is the classic abnormal finding in these patients, and that uh, Don Creel will tell you about, and they typically will have a normal ERG. And so with these diseases, you want to do uh, monitor for choroidal neovascularization, give them low vision services as necessary. Again, it's kind of like Stargardt disease. They will probably not not go to, they may hit legal blindness and then just stop. And then you want to do genetic counseling, gene therapy if it's available, when it becomes available, genetic testing. Then after that, we start getting into the rare things, things that, I've, that I, I don't see in my practice, uh, but are going to be, but are uh, at least in the literature because they've been known for so long. Uh, there's Soresby fundus dystrophy, which is a very rare form of, uh, of macular dystrophy associated with choroidal neovascularization. They have abnormal dark adaptation and peripheral drusen. Um, it's found in the British populations, as uh, Soresby is a, is a, was a British ophthalmologist. And the, the mutation, though, this is important because the mutation is known. It's in the TIMP3 gene. This is definitely associated with some forms of AMD in the genome-wide association studies. There's no current treatments. It's a rare enough disease that there are people are not working on this disease. It's not, it's not going to have gene therapy very quickly. Then there's other things like Malatia levantinase or Doyne's honeycomb dystrophy, which are dominant drusen. The things, this will show up on some of the, on your OCAPs and boards with these large numbers of drusen here. And the, th the key thing that people talk about is they tend to be found in, uh, in this disease that's unusual is they often have drusen nasal to the, optic, uh, to the optic nerve and they have a radiating pattern for whatever reason. This can be compatible with good vision and its mutation is pretty well established. This is a monogenetic disease and uh, it might be associated with AMD. And then there's North Carolina macular dystrophy. This was one of the, they tend to have what are called macular colobomas here and they can be, they can have surprisingly good acuity. This might be a 2020 eye. And this was the first gene, uh, first macular dystrophy to have its gene found, uh, to have linkage and be established that it was an inherited disease, dominantly inherited disease but only in the last two years did they identify the gene. It turned out to be a very hard gene to identify. And, uh, and when they finally figured this out, it turns out that this is probably a, a congenital disease and not progressive. There's no treatment for this disease, um, but hopefully they can continue to see well. So I think that's, we have, that's what I've gone through here. And we can either have discussions or I can talk about cone dystrophies, which I kind of skipped through. So what questions do you have about macular dystrophies or retinal, retinal degenerations and how I handle it in my, my practice, what you should know? Any comments or questions? I mean, I think it's a, it's a very fascinating part, thing to know and to learn about these diseases when you're in my clinic. There's a lot of kind of thinking about how these diseases are affecting the families both socially what kind of biochemical approaches can be used with regard to things like Stargardt disease. There's a lot of real fascinating biochemistry that can be done. When you go back even, I'll go back here. When you attack the visual cycle for this, the, one of the other studies that we're working on is to figure out, you know, you're, we're trying to restrict the vitamin A going through this pathway. Well, what if you replaced your vitamin A with a different form of vitamin A that would just work fine in the visual cycle, but not form these toxic compounds? And so there's a company called Alkius that has come up with a deuterium labeled form of vitamin A that can be administered orally. You need to go on to, you don't have to stop consuming all the vitamin A in your diet, but you don't want to overdose it. 
You don't want to overdo your, your dietary intake of vitamin A. But we can give enough of this drug so that 70 to 80 percent of it of your body's vitamin A now becomes the drugs the drug form of vitamin A, and this one because of having three deuteriums in a, in a select spot in the on these molecules will uh, will not form the toxic compounds but will still work just fine in the visual cycle. So we have a couple. Yeah, I'll talk to you in a second. But so we have a couple patients in that trial, and they do just fine. You know, they don't have any visual complaints. They don't. Uh, you know, they're on, the diet's not overly restrictive on them, and they supposedly, if they, if they behave like the mice, will not form any of these toxic compounds anymore. So it's, I would consider it a well-tolerated drug. You know, of course, if it makes it to market, it's gonna be a ridiculously expensive drug, but it's, uh, it's, I think, a very elegant biochemical approach to this disease that doesn't have all the side effects. So I'm hoping it works, but uh, it's, they're, they're going very slow in getting this to try, uh, through the trials. They're not enrolling a lot of, some, of patients. So yes, Chris? Do you need to advise patients to avoid like, topical uh, vitamin A, like retinoids and things like that? That's probably not sig significant enough to cause problems, I think. Yeah, the topical, it's not absorbed enough to be a big problem. Basically, you tell patients with star art disease, don't go out of their way to take a lot of preformed vitamin A supplements, and that's been, that's been fine. Um, let's see, so with regard to genetic testing and, and, and just talking with the patients, it will be very helpful in having a genetic counselor on board. Right now, it's, uh, you know, I, I really think genetic counselors learn a lot, they know how to give reports to patients, they know how to, how to interact with these patients. It's been very hard, I've found, trying to do that myself. You know, we all have busy clinics. Patients need a lot more time to discuss this. It's hard to keep up on which are the proper labs to be sending tests to, you know, who will get back quickly, how do you select which tests should be done, how do you counsel patients whether it's worthwhile to spend the money out of pocket or to fight with the insurance companies to get these genetic testing done. Right now, with, um, that I've found is that in genetic, for genetic testing, the Insurance companies will often cover for it, cover it, but they require they make it difficult. You can't just order. The, you know, I want to get genetic testing for Stargardt disease and get reimbursed for it. They want a letter from the a genetic counselor, or a letter from the physician explaining why you want it. They just make you jump through a lot of hoops, and that's for a five hundred dollar test. If you're asking for for a, uh, a whole genome sequencing or a whole genetic uh, panel for uh, macular dystrophies or retinal dystrophies, you're talking about $2,500 or $3,000, and that's harder to get approved. Many patients are willing to pay out of pocket for genetic testing if you tell them why it's important that it will get them into clinical studies, that it might help uh, diagnose in the family, but it's very obvious you can tell what the price point is. $500, many patients will pay. As soon as you get near $1,000, they stop at two to three thousand dollars, almost no one will pay out of pocket. Yes? For some of these diseases, is there like a national database where after you get the genetic test, you can send it to the national database so that if there is some kind of gene therapy that then comes about, it would just automatically be called upon or be used archive it and then but, Okay, so right now, that's a good question. Right now, we have our own local database that we're keeping in hope and that it's kept in clinical studies right now. We then, um, we update that, and so when, when we're approached, and I get a lot, you know, I get people writing to me, you know, how many, you know, we're coming out with a, with a treatment that's targeting P23H rhodopsin, we'll ask how many patients do we have? Well, we can give that number. There is no national database right now out there, registry, People have tried to do that, but that has not happened yet. On the other hand, some of these companies are developing their own. So why is Spark doing genetic testing? Well, they want to find, they want to find every patient in the United States with RPE 65 so that they can, have, they can offer their treatment to that. But they, have, they now know, that they're developing their own database, of course, that, that, is, their, that is theirs, their, a proprietary database 
that knows all the genetic profile. And there is a huge variation just by region in the United States. There's all these founder effects. It's really, it's very real. Yeah. I think it's better for a company to have this database as opposed to the federal government in terms of ethical issues. Yeah, I, ethically, I don't know. But I think they're providing a service, and I think it, it's, you know, there is still confidentiality. They're not contacting the patients, but they at least know they can target where they're going to, you know, which diseases they want to go after. But they still, if they want to get the patients, they still have to, what the current standard is, is to contact inherited retina disease specialists around the country and ask, well, what do you have at your site? And then, and then go from there. Because they, they won't do anything more beyond that. Ethically, they can't go, they can't go from there. But that's, that's the price we pay. We give up a lot of, we give up some privacy, but to get, they are, they are providing a service that's valuable to patients. So, I will let people go.